Welcome. Everything is fine. You're listening to Fork and Bullshirt, the Good Place podcast. I'm Jason. And I'm Vivian. And we'll be the architects of your journey into the afterlife. This week we're talking about Season 1, Episode 6, What We Owe to Each Other. This episode was written by Dylan Morgan and Josh Siegel. They are both co-executive producers on the show, and this is the only episode they'll write this season. This episode was directed by Tucker Gates. He directed a number of Lost episodes, including Confidence Man, the Sawyer episode, and Across the Sea, which is kind of a controversial episode in Season 6. The creator, Michael Schur, was actually inspired by Lost, and he spoke to Damon Lindelof when he started brainstorming for The Good Place. If you're a fan of Lost, I'd like to recommend a great Lost podcast called Lost Watch. It's by The Ordinary Folks, two friends of mine, Allie and Nathan, and they're going through the series episode by episode, and they do live tweets on Twitter every Wednesday and Sunday, so it's a lot of fun whether you're a really big fan of Lost and you've seen every episode multiple times, or it's your first time getting into the show. And uh, yeah, you can find everything about them at theordinaryfolks.com. All right, this episode of The Good Place aired on October 13th, 2016. And for this episode, we're going to split our discussion into three parts. One, the Michael and Eleanor story. Two, the Tahani, Jason, and Chidi story. And three, the flashbacks. So, Jason, what are your initial thoughts on this episode? Did you like it or not like it? Wah, wah. <laughs> oh, wow, okay. <laughs> Sad sound effects. Yeah, I wasn't... Oh, do we have those? Can we insert them? <gasps> we should. We okay, we'll do that. We don't have those. No, we'll find them. I think we just found them. Wah, wah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Initial thoughts. Eh, I wasn't a big fan of any of the storylines, really. Really? Okay. Except possibly Michael and Eleanor's. I think that was the only one that didn't feel forced. Interesting. I think we're going to disagree there. That's fine. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> I mean, that's that's part of the beauty of this uh, this podcast, right? Yes. Yeah. Exploring different uh, opinions. Yeah, this, this episode is kind of like Oprah. You made a promise, and you made a promise, and everybody made a promise! You know, like, <laughs> there's promises and promise breaking literally everywhere in this episode and it is not subtle and that's the theme of this episode i know it's promises everywhere it's kind of hitting me over the head with a brick so there's a bit of that in this episode and i kind of prefer a little bit more subtle storytelling where Mm. i have to really like lean in and figure it out for myself it just yeah it's a bit too obvious i think I didn't see it like that. Okay. Only because I don't think I was looking for it. I didn't see it as a lot of different promises made by everybody. Oh, that's all I could see. That's because you've been (laughs) diving into it for the past, like, week. (laughs) All right, so let's start with the Michael and Eleanor story. Eleanor agonizes over keeping her promise to Michael. She fears detection. So she distracts Michael from his investigation with karaoke, skee-ball, and bowling, hoping to help him while not helping him. Michael believes the cause of all the trouble is one of the residents. He concludes that he is the one responsible. So at the beginning of this episode, Chidi reminds Eleanor that she made this promise and that she should keep it. And Eleanor doesn't know whether she should because as soon as she does help Michael, then maybe he'll figure out that she's the problem. So we're in a big damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. Absolutely. So I guess we'll jump right into the philosophy part of our episode. Chidi our... introduces her to contractualism. Yeah, he introduces her to contractualism by using um, T.M. Scanlon's book called What We Owe to Each Other. Which is the title of the episode. Yes, it's the title of this episode. This episode is all about promises and whether or not we are morally obligated to keep them. So Chidi introduces Eleanor to T.M. Scanlon's book, What We Owe to Each Other, where Scanlon introduces the ethical theory named contractualism. First, I want to point out that this theory has similarities to contractarianism, which is a moral and political theory sometimes described as the social contract theory, with its roots in Thomas Hobbes, 
and adopted by John Locke and many others. So I'll briefly summarize contractarianism. In the super convenient comic strip? I wish, (laughs) if only. (laughs) I have to admit now to you listeners that I was reading about contractualism this week and it was just giving me headaches. Like, it's just weirdly confusing because I was trying to get into the weeds and figure out some of the more complicated parts of it when really I should have just stuck to what Chidi says. Anyway, we'll get back to contractarianism. So Hobbes believed that in the state of nature, so a world without rules, human life would be solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. In this world, where no one is governed, it provides everyone unlimited freedom, but zero security. So to avoid this, rational people enter into a contract, a social contract. Society. Exactly. Giving up some of their rights to obtain the benefits of order in society. Hobbes didn't think that morality was a was primitive or natural, but that a group of free, self-interested, and rational people, morality would emerge because people realize that there are more benefits to be found in cooperating. So the difference is that contractualism, which is the one we're talking about here, seeks principles that no one can reasonably reject rather than principles that we would all agree to. So Chidi's summary of contractualism is actually pretty good. He says, Imagine a group of reasonable people are creating the rules for a new society. Anyone can veto any rule if they think it's unfair. So, if you said we should be able to break our promises without any repercussions, someone would veto that rule. I think that T.M. Scanlon would argue that the obligation from a promise derives from a more basic moral obligation to not unfairly manipulate others. So not necessarily that you would just veto that rule, but that you would reasonably reject that rule. A person has a moral duty to keep their promises because making a promise will lead others to believe that you will do what you promise. Mm -hmm. And breaking a promise is then equal to deceiving others. And since one has a moral duty not to deceive others we have a moral duty to keep our promises. So contractualism is a morality by agreement. The main purpose of ethics is to justify our actions to others because humans are social beings. So moral views are derived from reasoned arguments and we create our ethics out of what we can agree on. We present arguments and others either reasonably accept them or reasonably reject them. And that is all morality is created from. Not from heavens above or from some sort of intrinsic morality that we find in ourselves. Mm -hmm. Just rules that we can agree on or disagree on. (laughs) And without that, we're just primal beasts. Yeah, basically. So, Do you agree to that? Or do you agree with that? Um... I think that contractarianism, like what John Locke is talking about and Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Thomas Hobbes, like I I tend to agree with that side more, Mm -hmm. that we enter into our contract because it mutually benefits both parties. I don't really like the idea that you can just kind of make up rules and then we either agree on them or disagree on them and that's all morality is. Mm -hmm. Like it just feels... To me, because of the society that we're in, like certain things are just morally wrong. Right. I don't know where that comes from. Right. So it's it's interesting to think about, though, because that's kind of, in a way, how society operates. Like, we make up new rules to things as they present themselves. So when Eleanor is saying, your ride should be free if your Uber driver talks to you, that's something we didn't have to deal with in the 17th century. Right. I mean, unless your carriage driver was a real chatter. <laughs> but yeah, that that's kind of a modern day thing where maybe you don't feel like interacting with someone on the subway or you don't feel like interacting with the person who's driving you somewhere. And then we have some sort of rule like it should be free then or your pizza should be free if it's, you know, minutes 30 minutes or more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it, it's interesting. Like, I don't dislike that theory. I just don't know if I completely ascribe to it either. What do you think? I agree. I don't know where these feelings come from. 
I know I wasn't raised feeling like my pizza should be free if it was 30 minutes late, mm. but I feel like people shouldn't kill each other. Mm -hmm, but where mm -hmm. does that come from? Does it that come from what I know about the world, what I see on TV, what the movies that I watch, yeah. the books that I read? Or is that something ingrained in me? Is that my basic instinct? Don't kill people because I don't want to be killed. Yeah, and contractualism would say that killing someone is only morally wrong if you can justify that it is. So if your argument is strong enough to persuade other people that killing is wrong and then they can't reject that's it. That's the only reason. That's the only reason it would be morally wrong. Right. Whereas contractarianism would say it's morally wrong because we don't benefit from killing other people. Where, Like you might say, oh, I benefit from killing my neighbor who always keeps me up uh, when he's mowing his lawn at three in the morning. <laughs> no, this is not a real situation, that's, but that's yeah, yeah. Like sure. I would benefit from that, but a society where that is allowed would not benefit. Nobody would be mowing their lawn at three in the morning. That's true. It would be a good warning to those people trying to mow their lawn at 3 a.m. But having that right. rule in society saying, oh, it's okay to kill someone if they annoy you enough, you know, that creates havoc. Yeah, it's Which is bogus. benefiting no one. Right. Gotta say, it's uh, kind of a mouthful or a brainful. Yeah, it is kind of a brainful. It feels like it anyway. So I was saying that this episode, to me, is all about promises. Scanlan feels that we have a moral duty to keep our promise because not doing that would be deceiving others. But really, in our daily life, there's a varying degree of promises you can make, right? There are varying degrees of yeah. promises. Yeah, exactly. I you promise would... to turn off the light when I leave the room. Yeah. Oops. And if you forget, I'm not going to say, oh, Goodness, you have deceived me now. <laughs> You're such a deceiver. Yeah. I don't think I could ever trust you again. I don't feel like that would be something morally wrong. Whereas if I make a promise to you to be faithful and then I break that promise by cheating on you, I feel like that's morally wrong. Right. And probably a lot of people would agree with that idea. So it, it's kind of interesting, like where... What's, Where can you draw the scale. line? Like, yeah. What's the scale of promises? How far can you go until it's wrong? Yeah. Or before it's forgivable? And is, is it only forgivable if you can justify that it is not morally wrong? So if I couldn't come up with a good reason why I didn't turn off the light, then that's a whole other ballgame. Yeah. So if you're just like, well... I wanted to spite you. That's a good example, because if you gave me that reason you said i'm not turning off the lights because you never turn off the lights and i hate you <laughs> well that just escalated <laughs> it did it did <laughs> as arguments always tend to do but um that would be that would be a good example of being of something being morally wrong because you're just doing that out of spite out of hatred right whereas if you say oops sorry i forgot or... i stubbed my toe as i was leaving the room so i was focused on my throbbing toe yeah, exactly. And then there you go. Your argument is valid. I agree to it. I cannot reasonably reject it. That's morality, according to <laughs> wow. contractualism. That's great. <laughs> All right, so let's get back to Eleanor and Michael. Okay. So Michael makes a comment about seeing in nine dimensions and how there's a lot of there's a lot of tension in the air. Which is interesting because, according to super strength theory, there are ten dimensions. Oh. And not one of them is emotions or feelings. Hmm. So, I'm just going to briefly, quickly go through the different dimensions because I, th I find it fascinating. Cool. Hey, we are the multiverse, okay, up in here. Oh, so... yeah. Absolutely. This is directly related to us. Yes, clearly. So, we all know the three dimensions. First one being length second one being height, and the third one being depth. And the fourth one is generally considered to be time. Okay. Now, after that, it gets a little wonky, which is great. Mm. And the fifth one is the possible worlds dimension, where there are two possible worlds. So there's Earth and another Earth that we can compare them to. So see what's, what's different, what's similar. Okay, kind of like Fringe, you know, the alternate, uh, the alternate Earth. Almost. 
Okay. But that's actually closer to, I'd say, the eighth dimension. Oh, but okay. We'll get we'll, to the we'll eighth one. Yeah. So the sixth dimension would be a plane, a single plane of all possible worlds with the same starting condition, which would be the Big Bang. Oh my gosh, that's a lot of possibilities to consider. All possible worlds. The seventh dimension would be a plane of all possible worlds, but with different starting conditions. So none oh. of these Earths or universes started via the Big Bang. And then this is where it gets Whoa. a little bit interesting. The eighth dimension would be a plane of all possible worlds with different start conditions branching out infinitely. So it's pretty similar to the seventh dimension. They're all different starting conditions, but this plane just keeps going. Okay. So and why would you say that that one is more like the fringe's the, alternate world? For me, it would be uh, more like the sixth dimension. So a plane of all possible worlds with the same start conditions. Because the multiverse in Fringe, all the different, the alternate worlds are all pretty much the same as Earth. Just smaller things have been changed. Oh, okay. So they all started via the Big Bang. They all have humans. They're all humanoid. They all have animals. We all breathe oxygen. Yeah, I guess that's true. Okay. The ninth dimension would be all possible worlds, starting with all possible start conditions, and different laws of physics. Whoa. So what we know about physics could not apply. <laughs> and the tenth dimension, infinite possibilities. That's just all we can comprehend. We can't comprehend anything more than infinite possibilities because we are limited by our own brain. Yes. So wow. just a quick overview of super string theory and all the ten dimensions. Huh. Do you think Michael actually sees in nine of these dimensions? No, because that doesn't make sense. Why do you say that? Because you don't really... To me, you wouldn't see other dimensions okay. outside of time. I feel like the fourth dimension... If we're, if we're adhering to super string theory, you should be able to see the fourth dimension as time. So you should be able to see the beginning, the end, everything. And we have an idea that Michael does see that like mm -hmm. he is aware of time right and he's aware of like everything at once yeah yeah exactly he can go ahead and look at anything that's that had happened on earth no matter what time it was and just be aware of that knowledge and yeah. learn it yeah. we do see that in a deleted scene well not a deleted scene but in the extended episode where eleanor brings up elmo yes and exactly. michael stops for a moment he says let me just look up elmo yeah, and then we see Michael, what seems to be, like, watching all of Elmo's history yeah. in a fraction of the time, mm -hmm. right? Oh, no, he's being overused. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but to me, being able to see anything outside of the fourth dimension of time. So all po the possible worlds or planes or infinite possibilities, any of that stuff. Yeah, I feel like Michael would be limited to his plane of existence. So he can view things from Earth, but he's not exactly going to show up on Earth. He is still part of the afterlife, so he's still restricted mm -hmm. to this place or to this plane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. my belief. We don't get any evidence that he has ever been to Earth. In fact, we get evidence to the contrary because he seems to have this kind of fanboy attitude to humans and human life mm -hmm. with all his... Um, his collection of human objects, which are pretty ridiculous um, yeah. and kind of interesting. Lips. Yeah, he's got a pair of wax lips, a cheese grater, a tape dispenser, a slingshot, an eraser, a paper footfall, paper clips, a mouse, a Mark Twain bobblehead, and a comb. Very boring. random assortment of stuff. Yeah, and all kind of boring and also useful things which is interesting practical. like other than wax lips and the bobblehead everything has some sort of practicality mm -hmm. right erasers paper clips mouse office supplies yeah <laughs> he just like really loves office maybe supplies, he just raided a staples or something <laughs> oh i like that and it's kind of funny like he's not supposed to have that stuff but he collects it mm -hmm. he's breaking a rule yeah that's michael for you. he's a rebel you know it. He's also living in his neighborhood, which is against the rules, but he talked his way into it. I don't know if it's so much against the rules as it's just never been done before. Okay, that's fair. Yeah. But that's the first time we figure this out in this episode. We learn that architects don't usually live in their neighborhoods. And doing this was his idea. And that he's going to be in big trouble with his boss if things don't go smoothly. Mm -hmm. which, which is the 
first time I think we actually get confirmation that he has a boss. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that he's not the boss. So we can talk a little bit about some of the writing in this episode. Mm. Some of the jokes. Yeah. The jokes are a little overdone, in my opinion. They feel too sitcom-y. Mm. Okay. Out of character for the other the other episodes, to me. All the right. other episodes were a lot more clever. I wasn't a huge fan of the Friends references. I thought a one-time mention would be great at the beginning when mm-hmm. he mentions, I even watched all 10 seasons of the show, mm. Friends. And those guys were really friends, weren't they? Yeah, that I was kind of cute. Great. Yeah. But then we just kept doing it over and over and over. And yeah, it started to get a little tired. After and... a while, I started to dislike it. I did like his joke about, or his reference, actually, to Ross and Phoebe. It worked for me because it suits Michael and Eleanor because Michael's the smart and kind of nervous guy, just like Ross, and Eleanor is abrasive and sarcastic like Phoebe. Mm. That might be controversial to say. I know a lot of people (laughs) really love Phoebe and she is very sweet and loving and all these things, but she can be super abrasive. Oh, absolutely. And very sarcastic, so. It also works on the physical level because Ross is physically similar to Michael. Tall, thin, and Phoebe is kind of similar to Eleanor. Blonde. Yeah, Michael's obsession with friends and with random human objects is kind of endearing, but gets a little tiring by the end of the episode. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I do like Eleanor and Michael's big day out. That's kind of cute. They have a lot of fun. Yeah, they do. And it makes me think that maybe Eleanor has something to offer the people here without hiding her true nature. Like, she gives people the opportunity to have fun and to relax. And that's nice. That's something important for human beings. Like, recreation, relaxation are important things. And people are not really having a lot of that lately. They were alone. There was nobody at ski ball. There was nobody bowling. Exactly. It's like people are not even taking part. Yep. Um, on that note, do you have like any idea of the geography of the good place? Because I'm lost. Like I don't know where anything is in I would like to see to an overhead other. view of like everything. Yeah. But I, I feel map. like some of these things are just popped into existence. Oh. That's kind of cool though to think about. Like maybe if Eleanor just wants A bowling alley and a ski ball arcade Mm -hmm. place and a bar with karaoke. Badly enough, it'll just appear. I just have no idea of, like, where Eleanor's house is. In relation to downtown. Yeah, in relation to, like, our little downtown area and where that cliff was where Where Chidi Chidi was was, uh, overlooking the neighborhood when, uh, when Michael was telling him he should be, like, Christopher Columbus. I don't know where these things are, and it kind of bugs me a little bit. Like, I would like to know where things are. Yeah, I'd like to see a map. It would help make the show feel a bit more real, too. Yeah, I think so. And that's that's a common complaint of fans of Buffy, actually. Oh, really? Because people start wondering, well, where is the bronze in relation to Buffy's house? And how does... A town like Sunnydale that's supposed to be fairly small have docks and an airport and a massive university. Like, there are things that don't really make that much sense, Mm. but that we just accept when we're watching it. And that's what I think we're doing here. Like, we're just accepting that this is the world, but there are actual fairly legitimate reasons why things might just be there. And we have no idea where they are. they are just created. Yeah, exactly. They just pop up. Can I have a map of this place, please? (laughs) Guys, make it happen for season two. Give me a map. What did you think of her her turn in this episode when she finally decides to actually help him, not help him without helping him? At the very end when she's with him at the restaurant? Yeah, when she's trying to comfort him when he's he's gone hoodie mode. Let's talk about the hoodie for a second. Oh, okay. Because that was really on the nose for me oh okay. community wise oh. <laughs> yeah, would that this that. hoodie be a time hoodie <laughs> and dean pelton craig pelton just wraps himself up just like michael 
puts it over his head, tightens it, and curls up on the floor in the episode Fiercy Theories and Interior Design. Yeah. Which is just, incidentally, one of my favorite episodes of Community. Oh, it's fantastic. Um, But yeah, that, that scene was way too obvious for me. And uh, both shows were NBC as well, so. Oh, it, Maybe it, I was the only one who noticed that. Does feel like a little bit of a, a wink to Community. And Eleanor deciding to help him at that point was really sweet because it felt like the most important thing for her at that moment was to help him and not save herself because he was feeling sad, depressed, he tried everything, and nothing worked out. So Eleanor seemed to really pity him. So you believe this turn? Like, you totally buy into it emotionally? Eleanor? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Okay. I don't feel like she was being insincere. Okay. And you feel like we've worked her up to this point, like, it's believable? Like, the show itself has, like, pushed her to this point that she would help Michael over herself? See, that's my point, is I don't think she was thinking about that. Oh, okay. I don't think she was thinking about her own safety, I'll say, or her place in the good place. She was only thinking about Michael. Interesting. Because that's her main concern, right? Like, that she will be discovered. So that's why it was such huge growth for me, is because she finally did something without thinking about the repercussions for herself. Okay. I don't know if I totally buy it. I think I would buy it more if it had come from somebody like... Or if it had happened in a situation with someone like Chidi, where she felt like a closeness to that person. But I don't feel like she feels all that close to Michael. And maybe that's part of the point, is that you don't have to feel emotionally attached to somebody to do good things, right? Right. You don't only do good things to people that you care about. You do them for everyone. That's the idea. Right. Um, I guess I just don't feel like it's her giving herself up in that moment. If she had said to him, it's me, but because she just said, well, I don't know how I can help you, but I'll do my best. I'll do my best doesn't mean to me, I'll tell you. Saying I'll do my best means I'll do whatever it takes. And if it means that I'm out, then I'm out. Okay. But if it doesn't, then fingers crossed. Yeah. Because she doesn't say any of that. No. But when Chidi approaches her in the next scene, she says, I offered to help him and helping him led him to me. And she says it in such an accepting way. Yeah, I guess I... I would have believed that that's what she was doing, like sacrificing herself if she has just come out and said it. Whereas she says, well, I'll do my best. And it seems to imply that I'm not going to try to distract you with other stuff. Right. But it's also not saying, hey, I'm going to give myself up. Right. Because I want to help you figure out what the actual problem is. Right, right. I'm not going to go out of my way to throw myself under the bus. If Mm -hmm. If it comes to that, then fine. But if it doesn't, then I'm not going to help you along. Yeah. I'm not going to help you come to that conclusion. Yeah. Which is a believable turn for Eleanor, right? Like, yeah, I, I would totally buy that. Yeah, okay. No, no, no. You're you're starting to help me like this scene a little bit more. Yeah. She doesn't outright say it, but if it goes there, then she's, she's okay with it. She's not going to fight it. Right. She okay. accepts that her fate. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to the Tahani, Jason, and Chidi story. Tahani invites Jianyu to the spa for a couple's date to help them bond. Jason is terrified he will reveal himself, so he asks Chidi to join them. Chidi tags along and keeps Jianyu quiet. Chidi and Tahani share a moment, but Tahani ultimately accepts Jianyu as her soulmate after he gives her a gift that Chidi arranged. So you're not a fan of this story? No, not until the end. Oh, okay. It feels so cliche it's i believe it's dramatic irony because we all we'll know go with that yeah we all know the problem and we know why chidi is there we know how the whole situation is going to play out before it even happens yeah we know that things are not going to be successful and it is boring because we all know what's going to happen i'm frustrated because the episode ends their part of the episode ends so well that it shows that they could have done so much better earlier on can you... The first part feels weak, and the second part feels really strong. Oh, okay. All right. Interesting. Did you enjoy any of the jokes? Not really. Oh, okay. I like this part a lot better. 
actually. Janet felt forced. Janet's weird does not compute part was kind of bizarre. And but... it was even longer in the extended version. Her not understanding the the three is a crowd or the, the three, the thruple. It was just nothing about it was funny to me. I didn't like any of that. I, I actually kind of like that part. Really? Um, Janet's just complete incomprehension of Chidi being, you know, a single person going along with a couple was mm. funny because, well, what if they were in a relationship, the three of them? What if it was like a polyamorous situation? Would she be able to wrap her head around that? Because it almost felt like Chidi was saying that. He was like, they're a couple and I'm a single part with this couple. Mm-hmm. And I was like, are you saying that you're all dating? But So do you think that that is a possibility in The Good Place? A thruple? Not in this version of The Good Place. Yeah, I don't I don't think so. Because we get this idea that you have a soul mate, not, not soul soulmate. mates. Plural. Yeah. It's not something that we see. Obviously, Janet's reaction shows that there aren't any. Well, not in this place anyway. Yeah. yeah. She seems to not understand what this idea is, which is kind of how society acts towards polyamorous relationships now anyway, right? It's like, what? How are you dating two people? Well, I doubt it in any of the good places because Janet is just a copy of all the other Janets. Yeah, yeah. That's so, true. Oh, interesting. Janets mm-hmm. would be able to compute a polyamorous relationship. I don't know. I just think it's cute that like Janet's joking now and... I don't know. I like the jokes. I like Jason saying, do I be nice to Tahani or do I throw all of her jewelry in the toilet? I just thought it was funny because how is that the opposite of being nice to her? Like, my reaction is exactly Chidi's. <laughs> and it implies that he's thrown someone's jewelry in the toilet before. Yeah, I, I don't know. I would be real peeved. The- I liked his, I liked Jason's relying on the magic eight ball and then okay. saying agreeing to going to the spa purely because he doesn't know how the heck to read a magic eight ball or to like (laughs) that was my i think my favorite joke out of their whole interaction okay the magic eight ball i do like his obviously limited knowledge of film when he's talking (laughs) about tahani and he's saying well she's so pretty like nala in the lion king and she's so smart like Nala and the Lion King. And I was like, is that the only movie you've seen? <laughs> or maybe he's just got a thing for Nala. He's just got a thing for Nala, which is also weird. I would have so. liked it if we had seen in earlier episodes a Lion King poster in his little butthole. Oh, that would have been great. That would have been yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah, that would have been great. Oh, that's too bad. That's a missed opportunity. Too much forethought. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> I did like this storyline because I felt like it was a less in-your-face exploration of promises and whether or not it's okay to break a promise to someone. Because Chidi briefly considers whether or not he should tell Tahani about Jason's true identity. You know, he says, maybe I'm obligated to tell her. Is ignorance bliss or will the painful truth actually be healing? He contemplates which obligation is greater. So should he keep his promise to protect Jason and help him earn his place, just like he's doing with Eleanor? Or does his obligation to be honest with a fellow human trump that? What do you think? Like, what would you do in his shoes? I guess I would probably take Tahani's happiness because Jason's kind of useless. (laughs) Yeah, no, I've... (laughs) Yeah, I think that if I was Chidi, I would be more inclined to tell Tahani the truth. Because I would empathize with her and I would feel terrible that she's going through all of this. And knowing that you can fix the problem. Yeah. And knowing that you can at least tell her and then she can stop worrying about trying to make things happen with Jason. But at the same time, I get why he's conflicted. Like... I don't think that he feels particularly attached to Jason. So he's not doing this because, you know, oh, he loves Jason so much or they're they're such good friends that he feels like he needs to keep this promise. But if he doesn't, Jason could tell anybody about Eleanor. Right. Right? So I feel like that's, like, we're doubling up there, right? Right. It's not only his promise to Jason, but it's his promise to Eleanor that could potentially be in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. 
I kept thinking in this part, if I was Tahani, I would kind of start to wonder if something was going on between Chidi and Jianyu. <laughs> because, no, okay, okay. You're giving me a look. He's giving me a look, listeners. Um, because she always looks for these moments. It's like the community episode. <laughs> the long stares. You know I'm gonna the add stolen in the song glances. Now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I I would because Chidi decides to come along all of a sudden, and he says like, "Well, Gianni feels comfortable when I'm around," and it's like, "Uh, okay, why does he feel comfortable with you?" And he she knows that. Jianyu has been spending more time with Chidi. She doesn't know what they're doing because she obviously doesn't know that they're having ethics class. Yeah, it's probably the last thing she's thinking about. Exactly. So she's like, okay, well, what are they doing? And not only that, but he offers to massage Jianyu. And Chidi is trying to keep Jason from saying anything to to Hani. And I would just, I feel like if I was her, I would start to wonder. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying that I actually see, like, a budding romance here. I (laughs) I know, I know, I I don't. I'm not, like, shipping that train or anything. Shipping that train? That doesn't make sense. I'm not shipping it. I'm just saying, you know, it would be reasonable if Tahani was suspicious. So the part that you liked starts, what, around the time where Jason decides to have an Impressionist painting made for Tahani? No, after that. After that. Okay, when so you don't like the Frank Caliendo joke. I was more talking about um, Chidi and Tahani's connection. Okay. Because I think they have a fantastic connection. So do you ship it? I like them as a couple. Yeah. Oh, you ship it. That's that's basically like a ringing endorsement from Jason, guys. That's about how excited he gets about this. <laughs> oh my God. I like it because it shows that Chidi was listening. And took what he heard and made something beautiful for Tahani. Do you think he actually painted it or just commissioned it from Janet? I like to assume he did it. Maybe he asked Janet to slow down time or something. Whoa, that would be cool if she could do that. Yeah, I I do like that scene. It's very sweet. I don't really see like a... I get that the show is trying to get me to see a romantic connection between these two. I think so. Because we have this lingering moment um, from Tahani, like she has a shy little look at Chidi right at when the end of the conversation. When he says we're soul friends. Yeah, exactly. And almost like a, well, I wish he was my soulmate. Yeah. And we're putting them in this situation, like a romantic cafe and someone mistakes them for soulmates. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like that's what the show is leaning into, but I don't see them as a couple. So I don't really mm. ship it. But I do like what this is saying because Tahani doesn't say to Chidi, well, I think that you're my soulmate. Well, no, because... She doesn't say anything like that. Jianyu is her soulmate. Exactly. Tahani has bought into what the good place is selling. She really believes that Jianyu is her soulmate, despite the fact that they have nothing in common. Right. She says it She there. accepts she's it blindly. Like, we're not... It's like she's saying we're not meant for each other, but we're soulmates. Because she just buys into what the good place is selling. Because why wouldn't she? Yeah. So even after having this moment with Tahani, she wouldn't violate this implicit contract with that Chidi. she's made. So despite having this moment with Chidi, she wouldn't actually violate this implicit contract that they've made. Right. She wouldn't pursue Chidi. And she wouldn't... But she isn't given an option to veto this contract or say anything about it she's Mm -hmm. put in this good place she's told this is your soulmate and that's it yeah so it's kind of like society you know we have rules that we don't actually agree to you know there are rules that i don't agree to in society that you can't jaywalk for example (laughs) like that's technically considered to be illegal but i think it's dumb so I never follow that rule. If uh, it's safe to jaywalk, I'm a jaywalk. Mad lads. Woo! Mad lads? <laughs> what? No? No, I have no <laughs> idea what you're saying. All right, <laughs> listeners. Mad lads. <laughs> Basically, it's where somebody <laughs> says something extremely mediocre. Very mediocre rebellion. Like, super <laughs> oh, okay. mediocre. Like, And then all of a sudden, you're a mad lad. Ooh, so like if you go to Bulk Barn and you like sample one candy, 
Is, th- is that considered mad lad? <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> okay. All right. I like that. That's cute. Not only just do you sample the one, you don't pay for the one. You'll Dude, pay for exactly, five, exactly. but you won't pay for six. And I'm talking about like a little candy. I'm not saying you should grab one of those massive lollipops, but you know, an M&M. A single m and I'm not paying for a single m and I'm just checking to see if they're fresh. <laughs> There's a great subreddit on Reddit, obviously, called Mad Lads. And I recommend everybody go check it out if they haven't already. And if you're not subscribed, why not? Yeah. Because you're a mad lad. Okay. Um, so, personally, I, like, I like this story. I think it's it's sweet. I do like the kind of sitcom trope because a lot of the jokes, I think, are well-delivered. And I think it's a little bit more subtle. The moment at the end is sweet with Chidi and Jianyu, and it's, it was bittersweet, I think. Jianyu handing over the Impressionist painting, and <laughs> I made you a art. <laughs> I think that was perfect. Uh, yeah, it's it's bittersweet. All right, so let's get to our last story, the flashbacks. Did you not want to backtrack a little bit? No. We could backtrack a little bit and talk about the Impressionist. (laughs) Okay, so... (laughs) (laughs) Our lovely host, Vivian, had the most wonderful face right there. (laughs) Oh my god, do we have to? Um, We have to do our research. I had honestly never heard of... Frank. I had never heard Cali- of either. Caliente. Caliendo. Caliendo. Talking about doing research. Can't even say the guy's <laughs> name, right? Anyway. Uh, yeah, the Frank Caliendo joke was kind of lost on me. Didn't know who he was. So I watched some of his impressions on YouTube. Meh. <laughs> That's how I feel about him. I don't think he's particularly good. There was a video of his stand-up in 2006 that I had watched before. Oh, okay. And I remembered his bit as soon as I was listening to it. And I gotta say, I enjoyed the crap out of it. Really? And a couple of years ago, actually last year, he did. He was on a, a talk show doing a Donald Trump impression. Yeah, I think his Donald Trump impression is terrible. <laughs> I thought it was great because it was <laughs> terrible. So, it's so bad. <laughs> but, like, he doesn't... I don't know. To me, he just like purses his lips out and then he's Donald Trump somehow. And I'm like, yeah. but he doesn't actually <laughs> sound like. Really? No, I don't think he sounds uh, like him at all. It I guess, doesn't work. I guess Jason and Jason have a little in common. <laughs> yeah, we both kind so. of enjoy some uh, some bad impressions. See, I love good impressions, but like they were bad enough to be enjoyable, but not so bad that it's like I, I don't even recognize who this is. Yeah, I don't know. I've seen better impressions. Uh, I was not that impressed. I mean, I guess it's kind of funny because that could be part of the joke, right? Because he's a very mediocre impressionist. Yeah, and then he's, you know, Jason makes this joke about about him doing the impression and he's trying to do it for him. And it's like, well, he's about as good as he is, so. (laughs) Sorry to any Frank Caliendo fans. He just doesn't work for me. Yeah, all right, so moving on from that. Let's move on from that. <laughs> yeah, let's go to uh, the flashbacks. Our last uh, our last story in this episode. All right. And thankfully our, our shortest. In the past, Eleanor promises to house sit and pet sit for a friend. She ditches her obligations in order to attend a Rihanna concert, resulting in her friend's dog suffering a permanent disability. Well, let's not say a permanent disability... No. Let's just say that dog is now forced to roll around in a wagon because he is obese. He's morbidly obese and his stomach expanded to the size of a basketball He's and will never shrink. He's cute and cuddly. He will never run again, Jason. He probably never ran in the first place. He might have. He we probably don't ran know. to the food. <laughs> well, he's being deprived of his food run. Now he can roll to the food. <laughs> Terrible. He might not be able to roll to the food. <laughs> he might just have to, like, I don't know, smush his way over, like, Jabba the Hutt. Permanent. I don't know how Jabba the Hutt, like, actually travels, but it seems like, like he would worm. just... He's like a worm. Okay, He's like, yeah. he slithers. So he kind of, like, wormy slithers. Inches his way around. Yeah, like a slug. And a so snake. Maybe the dog He's like a snake slug. slugs over to the food. So her friend is quite rich. Yeah. And I'm sure her friend can afford lipo for her dog. That's not the point. His stomach has expanded. Oh, she could get gastric bypass surgery for him, potentially. I don't actually know how that works. Whatever. They could cut a part (laughs) of his stomach. 
<laughs> they like could make it asleep. work. Anyway, I don't feel like they actually like cut your stomach in half. I don't know how this works, but I don't know. Whatever, whatever. I Let's didn't do any research on that. It. No, I don't think you were thinking that gastric bypass surgery was going to come up in this podcast. For animals. Yeah, for <laughs> animals in this podcast. But uh, so, so do these uh, flashbacks work for you? More of the same. Eleanor is terrible. Yeah. Yeah, the flashbacks don't really work for me in this episode. I don't like them. So how is she friends with this woman? That's what I'm thinking. How is that even possible? Like, this woman seems to be nice and quite wealthy, which I'm getting the vibe that Eleanor is not that wealthy. Like, she lives in an apartment most of the time. It's not like she's got this $680,000 house. And why is this woman trusting her with anything? The whole situation was not realistic to me. All the other flashbacks seem like they could have happened. Her Mm -hmm. at the bar with her friends? Absolutely. Yep. Her with the boyfriend and the coffee shop? Oh, yeah. No problem. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I believe that. I believe all of them except for this. Yeah. I don't feel like Eleanor would have a friend like this. And I don't think that anyone would reasonably entrust her with a task this important. They absolutely did not need to have her friend be rich. I think that having her friend being rich is sort of like the incentive here because I think we're trying to say that Eleanor will only help people as long as it's benefiting her in some way. Being able to house them for someone who has a real nice house, you know, and you get to like lounge around and watch their fancy TV and use their great speedy Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. But that's the only reason she's helping. Like she even says that, right? She says, well, you have better Wi-Fi than I do, so. Now let me pose you a little possibility here would it be more effective if it was one of her friends who lived in kind of a crappy house like her would it make her even worse person if she were just helping out and ditching out on her responsibilities because she wasn't doing it for a friend who was wealthy so she couldn't get anything out of it she was just doing it because they were friends and then if she bailed on her friend like her actual friend would that make it worse because to me it would be more effective Interesting. Because she's Um, helping out a friend because they're friends. Right, right. Not because she's going to get something out of it. I think it works for me because this flashback is really reinforcing the idea that Eleanor doesn't do nice things for other people unless it benefits her in some way. So if she, you know, would have the possibility of losing a strong friendship with someone by doing it, then that would be a loss for her, right? But in this case, there's no loss for her. There's nothing that's going to matter. So, of course, Eleanor doesn't care and breaks that promise immediately. That's why it doesn't work for me, because I can't believe those two as friends. Yeah, no, I don't really believe those two as friends, which is frustrating. I would like it, you know, if they actually seem to be friends, because I would understand why this person is trusting Eleanor. Yeah. But ethically, it works for me because... We're showing that Eleanor is a bad person. Yeah. Because there's nothing in morality that says that you should only do nice things for people that you care about. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, I just, it feels like bad writing to me. It wasn't great. Um, I wasn't particularly impressed with the writing in this episode. And this is the only episode that these two writers do in this season. So I'm interested to see if it's just something about the two of them that doesn't really work for me. You know, we might see them again next season. Right. So, yeah. So I'm going to kind of try to keep track of that when we uh, when we do get our season two. Oh, I wanted to ask you, do you think that Eleanor has a moral obligation to her friend's pet? I think everybody has a moral obligation to a pet or animal that they're looking after to keep them safe, keep them from dying. Why? Because as living creatures, we should look after them. The reason I bring up this moral obligation to pets is because this is an issue in a lot of, um, in a lot of ethical theories. Like people wonder what is our moral obligation to non-human animals? And contractualism is not an account of the whole of morality, but only an account of the morality of what we owe to other persons, not animals. So Scanlon also suggests a possible way that animals could be 
accommodated within contractualism. He says that this is via the notion of trustees to whom justifications of proposed principles can be offered on the behalf of the animals they represent. So what does that mean? So that means that we have a moral obligation to uh, that pet's owner, but not the pet itself. So Eleanor has an obligation to take care of Rufus or Only whatever because the dog's of name the owner. Is. Only because she, because that dog has an owner. Right. Because an animal, we're saying like the, the argument here is that an animal is not a rational being. You cannot have a conversation with them. Sure. They cannot reasonably reject anything that you say. Mm-hmm. Right? A human being can. So we owe the human being, the owner in this case, to keep our promises, but not the actual pet. I wonder, Jason, would you feel that way? If you were in this situation, you know, your friend has asked you to house it and to pet it, do you feel an obligation to that animal? Or do you only feel that obligation because you made a promise to that pet's owner? It depends on the pet. Okay. Can you elaborate on that? If it was a real jerk. Real jerk of a pet. Real jerk of a pet. So, like, if it was a cat that just hissed and scratched you every time you yeah, I'd passed by? Yeah, I'd resent both the owner and the pet, but I would do it for the owner. I wouldn't do it for the pet. Oh, okay. So if it's a nice pet, like if it was a cute, cuddly cat that just wanted to snuggle and play with a yarn ball. Hey, if it was a cat that just wanted to do its own thing and that completely ignore me, fine. I don't, I'm cool with that. Okay. But if it was being a real jerk. <laughs> <laughs> if it's being a real jerk to you, then it de- deserves you to what? Be a real jerk back? Well, yeah, you you give it out, you better be able to take it. <laughs> okay, except pets don't think that way. Exactly. <laughs> my that's my point. <laughs> but what's your point? I Damn, don't get I it. I thought it would be I thought that would work. <laughs> no. <laughs> I would not want the animal to die, regardless. Yeah, of course. But I wouldn't be happy doing it with a jerk pet. Well, no, I don't think anybody would, right? I don't think... uh, I would still feel a moral obligation to look after that animal. But I guess at the end of the day, like, I wouldn't be able to live with myself if I neglected it till it died. Or its stomach expanded to an unreasonable point. Oh my god! Okay, he's making this (laughs) face like, well... If it was out of my control... It's not. All right, well then... That's what she says. She's like, it shouldn't have even been a problem. You should have been there. (laughs) Yeah, I I wouldn't leave. No. God, no. Could never do that. I can't can't take it seriously, though, because it's such a comedic situation. Oh, it's so ridiculous. I can't even put myself in that fictional situation. No. It's just so out there. Yeah. Um... And the last, uh, the last promise that I will point out in this episode is that even Eleanor gets upset when Rihanna breaks her social contract when she arrives very late and a little drunk to her own concert. Because we expect people to be on time to their events and to do them professionally. Because that's what we're promised that they would do. Yeah, and you've paid money, right, to go to that concert. Mm Mm-hmm. And it would be frustrating to feel like your time and your enjoyment are not valued. Right. Right. So that's So she's a bit of a hypocrite. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Little bit. Eleanor is definitely a hypocrite. So after talking about it, do you like it more or less? Pretty much the same? It's the same. It's the same? Yeah. Okay. There's parts of it I like a little bit more. But uh, yeah, this overall is not my favorite episode. I feel like we've got some really good stuff coming and this episode just felt like spinning our wheels a little. Yeah, but it's pretty impressive that a show for a first season, this many episodes in, this kind of feels like the only meh episode. And it's not even that bad. I'm just critiquing it harshly because it's been so good. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If this was on any other show, if this was the the quality, like I would have no problem with it. We've got some really good stuff coming. And we got some stuff to talk about in the spoiler zone. Yes, we do. All right, so I would love to hear from any listeners that really did enjoy this episode. Um, tell us why, you know, let us know that you loved it, because I'm certain that there are people out there who just thought this was a riot, like just hilarious. Sway me. Yeah, sway us. 
I was looking up some of the ratings <laughs> online, and a lot of people are saying it's great. It's like a B plus, A minus. Yeah. One of the better episodes. I think really it's just that I feel like we're hitting the nail on the head a little too hard this episode. All right. So I guess that brings us to the end of the episode. But if you've watched the show in its entirety and you want to join us after the music, we've got a special spoiler zone section. Yeah. And we have a spoiler zone song. But don't come and hang out with us unless you've seen the show. Yeah, I know you you probably want to hear the song, but you can't come if you haven't seen the show. Yeah, come back later after you have seen the show and enjoy our weird spoiler song. We'll probably mess it up. A lot. But yeah. (laughs) So after the music... Stick around. Stick around. Hang out with us a little longer. And that'll bring us to the end of Forking Bullshirt, a multiverse radio production. And we actually got to talk about the multiverse in a way. Kind of. Whatever. We talked about dimensions. I'm happy. I'll give it to you. (laughs) Yeah. If you like our show, please leave a rating and a review on iTunes. It is the best way for other people to find the show. If you like our show, share it on social media. Talk about us. Tell your friends. Tell your grandma. Tell your weird uncle. If you have any thoughts you want to share, if you want to tell us that we're stupid for not liking this episode... You can find us on Twitter at Multiverse Radio. Jason, stop making a face. What are you doing? I'm looking at the microphone. It's fascinating. <laughs> you can find us on Twitter at Multiverse Radio and use the hashtag FBullshirt. Or you can find us on Facebook at Multiverse Radio Podcast. And you can visit our website and listen to all our podcasts there. And send us check a comment. Out, uh, yeah, send us a comment from there. Send us an email from there. And you can uh, go check out our Bob's Burgers podcast, too, if that's your thing. She just winked at you. Yeah, I don't know why I did that. It's not a visual medium, Vivian. (laughs) Stop being dumb. Yes, you can visit our website, multiverseradio.ca. Yeah, CA because we are Canadian, eh? (laughs) Oh, my God. Just go get me a double-double, eh? Maybe hop on our polar bear and just... Double-double and a pack of Timbits. Oh, yeah. (laughs) That sounds super duper. (laughs) Do you speak Tim (laughs) Horton? And we will see you next week for our review of episode seven, The Eternal Shriek, which is just like a cool name. Like, I feel like that needs to be a band name. Stat. Apparently a doctor band. A medical band. (laughs) (laughs) All right. See you next week, guys. Bye. Cue the music. Lights. Camera. Spoiler zone! (laughs) Oh my god. Okay, let's do the song. Spoiler zone. Spoiler (laughs) zone. Spoiled my fun. (laughs) Okay, let's try it again. Okay. One, two, three. Spoiler zone, spoiler zone, spoiling everything, spoiling food, spoiling movies. He was dead the whole time. Yeah! Woo! <laughs> oh, God. All those were... <laughs> All if only you lines. could see our red lines. <laughs> All right, Jason, so what are some of the spoilery things you want to talk about this week? I love how Michael is just messing with Eleanor the whole episode. Oh, my gosh, I know. Just completely messing with her the entire time. Acting so neurotic and paranoid and I think I know who it is who's messing with me or messing with the good place and I know how to fix it. Oh, just everything about it was great. Yeah, and taking his time to tell her that he thinks it's him. Torturing her. You know, oh yeah, just like revving up that anxiety, you know. I just, I like that his entire plan is just to frustrate and bore her Mm -hmm. with these Endless, menial tasks, like 90 minutes of staring at rocks. Kill me now. Seriously. That was in the extended episode, too. That wasn't in the regular. Really? Yeah, they cut directly to Eleanor saying, okay, we've got to move on. Like, you're being crazy. Yeah. And they didn't have the whole, okay, we've separated this all the piles and we've moved 
all the 70 rocks over here were just down to these three and it only took us 90 minutes blah blah, blah. that was all in the extended episode huh yeah, yeah it was interesting and his little comment well i'm thinking this one looks suspicious well, let's put so this let's one put back. it back yeah. in the maybe pile yeah. yeah he's doing all of this and then simultaneously overloading her with guilt and anxiety and it's just it's a great plan and i don't <laughs> one thing i don't get though is what he's doing with Eleanor when they're bowling, ski ball, doing karaoke. Like, what's his plan there? I don't think he has a plan at that point. I think he's kind of just enjoying it. Yeah. Like, they're having fun and they're not getting anything done, but that's okay. Maybe it's just prolonging the inevitable. Yeah, I feel like that's part of what it is. You know, he said, well, we passed some time and, and now it's done. Mm-hmm. And that's that's kind of what they're doing yeah yeah i like his comment i've come to like um i like his comment i've come to really like frozen yogurt there's something so human about taking something great and ruining it a little bit so you can have more of it Mm -hmm. that just feels like a big hint now huge oh it's great yeah like why would you need to ruin anything in the good place Mm -hmm. you shouldn't ruin anything yeah yeah and then again we're getting that you know? But that that is the good place. That's the exact embodiment of the good place. It's this perfect place, but a little bit is being ruined. Mm-hmm. There's some. There's little things here and there that are just wrong. Yeah, and that's not how paradise should be. Everything mm-hmm. should be right all the time. Yeah, right and perfect and wonderful. And we learn in this episode. Like I mentioned earlier, that architects don't usually live in their neighborhoods, and doing this was his idea, and he's going to be in trouble with his boss if things don't go smoothly. And we actually know this is all true. Like, Very he's true. Not lying. Yeah. If he's his just, experiment doesn't work, then he's going to be in trouble. Yeah, he's just, you know, leaving out the whole part about this actually being the bad place. Right. And that it was his idea to disguise it as the good place. Mm -hmm. Which is such a cool and smart idea. Very innovative. It seems like a lot of effort to just torture four people. But... But in his proposal, that's just the starting point. Exactly. Yeah, it's just the experimental phase. Right. Just to make sure, see if it works. And if it does, then they can roll out the full version and Mm -hmm. turn everything into everybody's personal hells. Yeah, exactly. And uh, to go back to the philosophy for just a moment, we touched on um, John Locke's social construct theory. And I wanted to point out that Locke also believed rebellion to be a justifiable response in the event of a contract leading to tyranny, which is exactly what Michael is doing. So he said, according to other social, uh, or I found a, So according to other social contract theorists, when the government fails to secure their natural rights or satisfy the best interests of society, citizens can withdraw their obligation to obey or change the leadership through elections or other means. When necessary, violence. So... Oh. Through elections or other means, including, when necessary, violence. So Michael being a leader... Yep. Implying that maybe a rebellion could take place? Yeah, he's failing to live up to the promise that everyone here is agreeing to. Like, the contract that people are implicitly agreeing to is that this is the good place, that we will be happy, that we will be safe, that we will have our true soulmate, Mm -hmm. and he's lying about all of this. So it made me think about the revolt that Eleanor tries to uh, organize in the last episode, like in the finale, when she realizes that this is the bad place. Mm -hmm. And Michael says, like, we're going to do this all over again. When she writes that note, that's her starting that rebellion. rebellion. Exactly. And uh, it was it was nice to see that uh, that that's actually something relevant. (laughs) <laughs> well, no, no, that it's not, not that it's something relevant, but that it's something that is morally right or that is considered morally right. What Eleanor does. Yeah, what Eleanor does. Yeah. Because we're not seeing in this moment that, uh, like in the last moment of the show that she's doing something morally wrong and corrupt. 
she's actually doing something right. She's trying to write things for other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, not only that, but the book that she uses to write that note is what we owe to each other. Hmm. It's the book from this episode. Okay. Yeah. That's a nice little callback. Yeah, yeah. This episode was a perfect example of the whole idea of everybody torturing each other yeah. because of Tahani, Chidi, and Jason. Mm-hmm. All three of them are literally just torturing each other this whole episode. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah. In all directions. In all directions. Yeah. Tahani is being tortured by Chidi, who won't leave them alone. Janyu is being tortured by... or Jason's being tortured by Tahani, who won't leave him alone. Mm-hmm. And Jason's... And Chidi's being tortured by Jason, who won't leave him alone. Yeah. So they're all like this holy triangle of, or this holy trinity of just torture. Yeah. And it's great. Yeah. It's a perfect example. It's one of the reasons that I love the episode for, no, it's one of the reasons how, and knowing how the show ends, that I love that about the episode. Right. Yeah. That was your favorite part, yeah. I think. And it's frustrating that on a first viewing, mm-hmm. it can seem very blah when you know that there's so much more going on after you've watched it. You can really appreciate the episode from so much more. I don't feel like that helped you like it, though. Oh, it really did. After oh, it watching did. Okay. the whole season, it makes me like the episode a lot more. Oh, okay. Yeah. I just, I can't talk about it in the non-spoiler zone because uh, I don't yeah, like the yeah, episode yeah. if I hadn't seen the rest of the show. Mm-hmm. But after yeah. seeing it, I know everything for what it is and it's fantastic. Oh yeah. To be able to see all the gears in motion. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Is really what, uh, what makes the episode, I think. Yeah. This is a great show to rewatch for sure. And that's my little twist for this episode of our podcast. I said I didn't like the episode, but I really do. Oh. I like it for the uh, other reasons. Jason, you have deceived us. Our <laughs> listeners have entered into I bamboozled a them. I bamboozled everybody. Our listeners have entered into a contract where they assume that you are being open and honest with them. And you have deceived them, sir. But they won't know deceived. that unless they're listening with me. That's true. <laughs> oh, goodness. So promises, man, promises. That's mm-hmm. all I got to say about this episode. Now. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> it's great seeing everyone's reactions after knowing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're going to have a lot of fun. There's some good stuff coming up. There's some other things that I noticed again. Mm-hmm. People friggin love carrying flowers in this stupid show. <laughs> there's if you pay attention to the background, there's always these people walking back and forth holding flowers and like what are they where are they going with these flowers what are they doing they're bringing them into their home they have fresh flowers every day why would they need to go out and get flowers couldn't they just the flowers shouldn't be dying in their house because it's a human thing that's what we're used to doing. <laughs> i know it just seems so funny <laughs> it's it's great i'm sure for the set dressers to just be like all right you guys are background you guys are extras here's your vase here's your flowers <laughs> You guys aren't carrying anything. Here's a bike. Let's put some flowers in the basket. <laughs> All right, you, you need some flowers. Grab some flowers. Let's go. <laughs> They're keeping like some florist in business, okay? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's called the good vase. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay, we have to end the episode there. Okay. <laughs> All right. We will see you next week. Thanks, guys, for sticking with us through the spoiler zone. It's always a blast. <laughs> All right. Bye, guys. Bye.